This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, we've packed a number of shows together to give you some highlights. I know you're going to enjoy the show. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome to the show. Honored to have you on. I read a little bit about you, and, and I'm looking forward to the conversation, just for your experience, your military background, all those things that uh, I'm shaped by as well. I, I just, I know the influence that has many entrepreneurs, and I'm looking forward to hearing about some of that as well in your background and in the way you and your, your partner has, has scaled, right? And you all done so well. And from starting from that, that Starbucks, right? <laughs> to where you all are at today. So, well, let's jump in. Let's ask give the listeners a little more about who you are and let's dive into some of your background. And we're going to jump into some of the things that, that are your superpowers to help the listeners today. All right. Hi, uh, hi uh, Whitney. Thank you for having me on. Uh, so, Stav Greenberg, I'm 35, married with three children, cur currently live in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and kind of on the line between Nashville and Miami and uh, all the states I'm operating in. We started the journey, me and my partner, as a childhood friends from a small town in the north of Israel. We came in the army as uh, combat officers in different units. And uh, we knew since childhood that we want to do some uh, future projects together. And we just didn't know what they are yet. As combat officers, in the idea, we started uh, investing our capital. And uh, we thought at the time, in 2011, we thought that it's the Israeli market is already too high by prices of real estate and doesn't make sense to pay those prices. It did triple since, but that was our analysis. And we started investing in the U.S. market. And at the time we started investing in like small new development, single families in Alabama. And we did it through a syndication company from Israel. And uh, we told uh, the guy, my partner, Peter, told uh, the owner of that company that if it's going to be successful, then we're going to uh, start, we're going to, after the release from the army, we're going to join them. And uh, that's what happened. And uh, after that, we had quite a lot of painful experiences with uh, investing from distance, from Israel in a far country through far syndicators, but all of those painful lessons did not discourage us, but kind of got our, got us more involved, more curious, more understanding that you need to be closer to the information, closer to the transactions, closer to the deals. And the last part was kind of a really bad deal we did in 2017 yeah, when we invested in a commercial office building in Atlanta, Georgia, together with investors that we brought in. And uh, that was the last painful lesson that kind of told us we need to do real estate from the ground. We need to be present and local to the real estate we are doing. And uh, we gathered those investors. We told them that we owe them this money personally because it could have been prevented damages in the deal. And that we're going to repay them back and it might take a couple of years. We jumped on a plane. We got to Cincinnati, Ohio, and we started growing our company from single families to fourplexes to eventually larger complexes. And today we, mon we manage 3,100 units of multifamily in four states. With the full vertical integration, we're doing the property management, we're doing the renovations, we're doing the, the acquisitions. We have an in-house acquisition team that is looking for the deals and finding them off market. And that's what we're doing. Wow. There's so, so many things there we could talk about. I, I wanted to jump into a couple things, um, but you know, you mentioned obviously difficulties investing from a distance, right? And you learn so much there. You realize you need to be, you said, closer to the information, closer to the deals. Uh, no doubt that's always helpful, <laughs> especially being in another country yeah. or halfway around the world. I, that could be very difficult to really know what's happening, right? Um, but this 
bad deal in 2017. You said, obviously, you all you lost some investor capital, but you all have committed to paying it back. Is that right? Yeah. So it, it was a true crisis for us, the, the event. And it took us three days to process how we're going to tell them the, info, the new pieces of information that we know. And uh, we decided to just go with the truth. And we bravely told them what happened and what, what we understand of the situation in the deal. And uh, we committed to pay them back. And it took us two and a half years, but we paid them back. We got them 70% back from the project itself. And uh, the rest we paid from our pocket. And today, those investors actually are investors in our company, and they are the people that spread the word and actually kind of ambassadors of our reputation. Yeah, I believe that. And I've heard that from other operators as well. The few that I've met that have been on the show that have actually said that, right? We've lost some money, but hey, we paid everybody back. And But I, yeah, I think it becomes almost some... I mean, it's massive learning experience, right? And it's, it just shapes you, I think, in a way that is different from somebody that's never experienced a difficult deal, right? Or deals yet anyway. <laughs> so if you're in this business long enough, it's going to happen, right? There's going to be, you're going to make a mistake, right? And, and there's going to be projects that go away that you didn't expect, right? Pretty much everyone's probably going to do that to some extent, but unfortunately, some worse than others. I love that you all committed to paying your investors back and just telling them the truth. Speak to the response that they had maybe right then and then compared to now. You, you already said they're your ambassadors now, but was that the way they felt then or did that take some time? Because I just, I want the listener to hear that, even the past investors that are listening to hear that as, as well. So, so for, firstly, I want to mention that there's nothing that's going to grow a business or an entrepreneur like crisis. And one of the most important of role of a leader uh, in any kind of organization is to be able to identify a crisis, to understand that crisis is happening, and then to try to find solutions to a crisis and then to grow from the crisis. So uh, that, that th saying that they were at the beginning very confused, very hesitant very there was even some trust rattled obviously at that point we brought in a legal counsel to help them to be kind of the in the, the in between person that is trying to recover the best from the deal and kind of a third party objective to the situation which helped and and he, we told him that he's going to be representing them until it's all over, uh, take the time uh, that it takes. And, and it's, some of them were trusting from day one and kind of appreciated the honesty. And some of them were more on the combative side and it took them time to adjust and adapt. But eventually when we kind of kept all of our promises through the two and a half years and paid everyone back, then I don't think there's one of them that did not appreciate it, looking at it backwards. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I just, I, I appreciate you just highlighting and being so transparent about that because I feel like in the moment, man, we're so tempted to maybe not do what we feel like is right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, when there's so much pressure, you know, in that kind of moment like that. And I, I loved what you said there. There's nothing that is going to grow an entrepreneur like crisis, right? You're recognizing that crisis, overcoming that crisis. I, I thought that was, that was a great quote right there. No doubt about it. It's just like the soldier, right? It's very different. The ones who have experienced yeah. the battle. <laughs> no yeah. doubt. And those are the ones you want to run next to. So, all right, we'll move forward a little bit. You all grew quickly. You and your partner, I think it's interesting. That you both were in the military together and and many of those experiences together, I think there's a camaraderie that happens in those scenarios. I've experienced it in law enforcement and military and all different scenarios for myself where, hey, these these men, that I mean, you, when you're in tough situations, I mean, they're like, you just can't even imagine being in almost, right? I think back and 
these guys that stood next to you. And uh, there's a camaraderie there of, of trust and relationship that's built, like almost can't be done any other way. And it's the same as just like this crisis almost, right? You get through those yeah. things together and there's a, a unifying that happens and, and a growth uh, even together. I think that's so incredible. Let's move forward a little bit and speak to the next components of your all's growth. Like what happened into scale right quickly, 3,100 units and even being vertically integrated, right? None of that happens just by sitting on your hands, right? Uh, and so what yeah. were, you know, some of the next steps that really were a launching pad for you, for your all's growth? So the first things that happened and we decided to be vertically integrated in advance, maybe it was trauma shaped from the, uh, that event and the, the initial desire in the business was to control every single aspect of it and therefore we are the ones who are leasing the apartments. We are the ones who are doing the deployments. We are the ones who are managing the renovations. We are the ones who are kind of doing everything. And eventually we started uh, understanding that we need people to help us because we cannot keep functioning. We got to capacity. We were working 24 seven, running to one of our complexes. One of the first complexes we bought were, was one of the hardest deals to manage we ever had. And you know, it was kind of a boot camp in, in a sense, because it was a building that every time it was raining, the entire first floor was flooding. And in the middle of the night, we had to go there with, the, as soon as we get a phone call from a tenant, to, we went there and we took a bucket and we tried to get the water out. And it was a pretty rough building. and. The, and we understood that we need people to help us. We brought someone with us that is going to do some acquisitions. We brought someone in with us that will start raising capital. And we started bringing people on board. And every time we felt like something is taking too much of our attention, or we find ourselves dealing 50% of our time with, that means we need an employee in that position. And one of the things that really helped us scale was that at the beginning, naturally for us two army guys, we brought in people that are kind of similar DNA, also past company commanders in the army. And, uh, and that kind of really increased the workforce because those people were very strong, very solution seeking, very not hesitant from crisis or bad situation. And before they bring you a problem, they try to suggest a couple potential solutions. And that was part of the secret of the past growth. And eventually that's what, that, that was one of the lessons that led us to create this uh, foundation in Israel of retired company commanders, where we understood that it's a special especially talented workforce that no one counts on. No, the, no one is waiting for them outside of the army. They retire at the age of 27, 28. They have been through very hard challenges and had always, they've been chosen over and over again. They had to overcome crazy challenges that people don't, aren't even aware of. And yet their value coming out of the army is zero. Not only zero, it's mine. It's negative because they're behind someone who's been through college, who has five years of professional experience, and their experience is not considered professional experience. And but we recognize that it's a huge strength, crazy manpower that they will not stop at anything before the job is complete. And and. That was part of the sequence. Yeah, that's interesting. For us. That's yeah, it's just interesting to think about that. How they're viewed, they're going into the job force. I think you you said it well there that they're viewed as being behind because they don't have the college degree yet or, or certain kind of schooling or those things. And I, I tell you that the more experienced people that I interview, I feel like it's 
it's almost a transition of, of thinking for the business owner, entrepreneur through, as they're growing. And as you hire enough people and have to let enough people go, you eventually realize that you, that character in that training, that even somebody in the military, but it's not always just military folks, but somebody that's of high character, like you can't train that almost. You can't teach it, right? And that's almost something yeah. that was taught right when they were little, right? At home or through military and experiences, things like that, that, man, you can train somebody to underwrite a multifamily deal, right? You can train somebody to find the deals or manage them or whatever. We can get you training or how to raise money, but I can't train you to be honest, right? Or even to have yeah. a mindset, like you said, of solution seeking and pushing forward until the job is done. I, I love that. No doubt about it. Speak to you or, or these the members that you hired, were they people that you already knew in the military or were, did you go seek after them? I just wonder how you found them. It's always a question of me and how do I find these amazing A talent folks that are going to come work for me that are solution seeking and have those characteristics like you're talking about? So originally we went with the people we know. It was someone the, who's the, the head of investor relations for us in Israel is the guy that served with Peter from bootcamp all the way to company commanders of two uh, companies in the same division. And we hired another guy. We knew his wife and she kind of suggested to us. And then we took one of them, one of their best friends in. And that, this is how we kind of found it and started it. But today we have created this foundation in Israel that we already have 1400 members uh, of those retired company commanders in, and we're helping them to connect them with the external organizations that could kind of gain from that talent. And on the other side, they can build a, a plan of how those people will start maybe in the bottom of the organization, but with some growth potential and with a plan on how do they evolve eventually to be senior managers in that organization with a serious plan. So we're solving the problem of uh, organizations to find this kind of manpower. And on the other side of those guys to be able to find their path to success after serving the country and uh, doing what they did. And they're uh, kind of shining their value. That's helpful. I tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. So, well, I have my LinkedIn at Taz Greenberg or the uh, company's website at vnbinvest.com. Those would be the two best ways. And it was a big pleasure with me. And I'm also, I read about your organization and I think it's a, an amazing cause. And uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of one of our dreams of me and my wife, after our own three children, to adopt a child in the future. We think it's one of the biggest meets to us, one of the best, if, if not the best act, one single act that a person could do, could do for another person is to adopt a child and change his life entirely. And I think that's something that is a personal dream of life. So. Wow. Great job for that. John, welcome to the show. I know you have a unique strategy for the market that you're investing in that I, I, I honestly don't ever hear hardly anything about. So I am <laughs> looking forward to this conversation and, and learning more from you and, and why you're excited about this specific market. Before we do that, man, give the listeners a little more about who you are uh, and your path to you know syndicating these deals. Absolutely. So I'll give you guys the 30,000 foot view, a short form of my story. I, I grew up in Kentucky and, you know, moved out to California after joining the Navy. I served five years as an air traffic controller in the Navy, got out and got hired by the FAA right here in San Diego as an air traffic controller. Did that for another six years, almost seven. As I was working as an air traffic controller, working long hours, doing lots of overtime, six day work weeks, I felt like I had reached my dream job and I was made. And um, I just real started to think to myself, like, wow, I really don't want to grind this hard my entire life. I don't want to be working the mandatory overtime. I don't want to be working weekends. 
And I started to also have excess cash that I can invest. Eventually, you know, a good friend of mine about five years ago introduced me to the Bigger Pockets podcast and said, Hey, man, you should think about investing in real estate. And uh, one day on a long drive, I popped on that podcast and started hearing all of these stories of everyday investors and school teachers, et cetera, that built up these real estate portfolios and were able to quit their jobs. And that just resonated with me. It really clicked. I got hooked, listened to every Bigger Pockets episode, started listening to other podcasts, reading books, and essentially just becoming a student of real estate investing. Um, my first ever uh, venture into real estate investing was uh, with a couple fellow air traffic controllers and a few other guys we had met in, uh, here in San Diego. We joint ventured on a 32-unit apartment complex. That was my very first real estate acquisition before I even bought my own home. And um, I liquidated my 401k in order to contribute to this deal and get involved. And uh, flash forward a couple of years, we added a bunch of values, sold that pro property, made a substantial profit. And then um, we wanted to start scaling, raising money from investors. And we got ourselves a really great one-on-one -on -one mentor, uh, a guy that has over 8,000 apartment units, has been doing the business for over 20 years. Shortly after that, he co-sponsored our first two syndications, two 150-unit complexes in Greensboro, North Carolina. And really after that, we were off to the races. We you know, doubled down on this business, went all in. I quit my W-2 job as an air traffic controller last year in March, actually. And today we have a little over 300 multifamily units with those two 150 units. We sold the first apartment complex, the 32 unit. We acquired a boutique hotel on the coast of California. And now we have a, a 13 unit project here in San Diego. And uh, we're going to get into that whole business model. But that's really the 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 short background of what got me to where I am today. That's awesome. I, I love the uh, just the action you took and and numerous things there that you did. But to dive into a couple of things, you know, you started educating yourself like mad, it sounded like, right? You started learning, started listening to all the podcasts, you know, uh, you know, and but then you also hired a mentor, uh, you know, give me the, you know, 30 second to a minute on how you picked your mentor. I get the question all the time. Yeah, and I get it too. Um, because people, you know, secure mentors for so many different ways. And for us, we had started our own podcast, uh, right at about the time we acquired that first 32 units. And uh, it was a real estate podcast. We were getting all these guests on the show, learning from them. And we had, so my mentor is actually two brothers. And uh, we had one of them on the show. And we were telling them about how, like, you know, how hungry we were, how we want to start syndicating and how a lot of the mentorship programs out there weren't attractive to us because they would have like a lot of students in the course. Um, your time with the top mentor that you want is limited to like, you know, an hour a month or an hour every other week or something Maybe. like that. Yeah. And while a lot of people are successful with that, that just wasn't attractive to us. So we were explaining to this to our now mentor. And he said, Hey, you know, we don't really do mentees, but we really like you guys. And uh, after a couple weeks of discussion, they agreed to become our one-on-one -on -one mentors. And they still are to this day. They have been for years now. So for us, you know, how we acquired them, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact of everything we were doing up to that point, how hungry we were, the success we had already had. And we just meshed well with, with, uh, with those guys. And um, I think that at the end of the day, that played into it because these guys don't need to be have mentees. Like the money doesn't matter to them. I really feel like they just uh, were happy to, you know, kind of give back and, and and hold our hands and help us grow. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And one thing you said there, I wanted to highlight before we move on, uh, is that the, these people didn't, the, this mentor uh, didn't have a, a mentoring program uh, that you actually reached out and ask if they would mentor you. Uh, and I, that's, that's incredible. I love that. You know, you all clicked, you, you'd interviewed them uh, and, and then they agreed to mentor you. Uh, and I like too that, that it, it I almost like it even better that it wasn't like their gig to mentor, right? I, you know, I, I, or have I a agree. mentoring program in that they're, you know, they're they're more so in the real estate business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, than the mentoring business, right? And, and uh, a couple quick things I've shared this years ago on the podcast when I was looking for a mentor many years ago, and I've got many more mentors now for lots of things. But uh, specifically when I was looking for one, it was like I wanted somebody that was in the business, right? They're actually doing deals now. There's people that were successful. 10 years ago, right? And then they just started mentoring, right? I wanted somebody mm -hmm. that, and, and that's not that they're very knowledgeable, right? Of course, right. they're very experienced. But personally, I wanted somebody that was in the business now. 
And I and you hit you hit the other nail on the head. I wanted somebody that I could speak to directly. And and mm -hmm. and there's plenty of people who have had success in other mentoring programs, and that works for many. Uh, for but for myself, I wanted to be able to talk to that person right often and exactly and, and work with them. And, and so so that was important to me as well. I appreciate you you know mentioning that. Uh, let's dive into your market a little bit and and, and why. <laughs> and so uh, you know, but you know you're you. You know, the Navy moved you to to California. It uh, sounds like, you know, you kind of started building some roots there. But what market are you in? And let's dive into why you're investing there. Glad you brought that up. So um, I, I want to address what everyone's thinking of themselves because it's the exact same thing I thought about investing in California. Most people will tell you that, and myself included, that I wasn't interested in value-add multifamily in San Diego for several reasons. Number one. Um, how low the cap rates were, how expensive it is to buy in. You know, you're typically not going to cash flow very well for for the first couple of years with the multifamily value add. Uh, landlord tenant laws are really strict here. So if somebody's living in a unit, I buy a multifamily property, and I say, all right, we want to not renew their leases so we can renovate those units. Well, that's not so easy to do here in California. If you're taking over and inheriting tenants, um, oftentimes these tenants can just sit around and say, no, I'm not moving. And the, the state gives them rights to do that if they've been living there over a year. So it's really difficult to underwrite and plan for, okay, this is how many units we think we can renovate each month or each year for that because of those laws. Um, and you combine that with the fact that you're buying these, you know, the typical multifamily out here was built in like the 50s and 60s, aside from all the brand new ones. And so you're buying an old asset that you're going to have to put a lot of money into. And it just... All for all those reasons, I just said, screw that, we're going to invest out of state. So all of our in investing has been out of state. Now, then San Diego, two years ago, put uh, changed their municipal code to allow for bonus ADUs. So I'll explain why they did that real quick and to provide some context. So San Diego uh, is, the, is growing, and its uh, job growth has outpaced the national average for years. It's a huge biotech hub, the third largest in the nation, loads and loads. I think uh, last I checked, 40% of all job openings that required a PhD were in biotech or bioengineering, and something like 20-something percent for all bachelor's degrees uh, or uh, new jobs. And then it's also the highest concentration of military assets on the planet. So you have a lot of jobs here and high-paying jobs. But the city of San Diego is geographically constrained. It can't physically grow outward. You've got the Pacific Ocean to the west, Mexico to the south, Rocky Mountain is trained to the east, and a military base to the north blocking it. So all of the flat buildable land has been built on. So what San Diego did, and really the state of California, is they introduced the accessory dwelling units, otherwise known as ADUs. And essentially, this just means if you have a single-family home or even a multifamily home, you can add you know, one to two accessory dwelling units to the property. And these are literally apartment units. So you could take a single family home and turn it into a triplex and it acts and operates just like one gets lended on just like one, et cetera. So they essentially are increasing the density where existing housing and uh, zoning laws exist. But San Diego took that a step further. And they said, we're going to, our problem is so bad here that not only are we going to let you do ADUs, but in certain zones, we're going to allow you to do an unlimited number of these ADUs up to the floor area ratio. So what this means is you can take a single family home that's on a single family lot or, you know, depending on what zone it is, if it's multifamily, you get even more density and you can build 10, 20, in some cases, 30 apartment units on that lot in markets in sub markets within San Diego, where you otherwise can't build new apartments. So as an example, we have a project right now that was a two bedroom, one bath house on a multifamily zone lot uh, in a beach community in San Diego, less than a half a mile from the beach. Now, there have been zero new apartments um, put online in that neighborhood for like the past four or five years. There's no vacant lots. So we're now taking that two bedroom, one bath house and we're adding 12 units to it. So it's going to be a 13 unit apartment complex. And I don't want to talk too long because I'm because I'm sure there's a lot to unpack there. And I could tell you all these different things we're doing to that that makes this strategy great and mitigate risk. But that's the gist of this strategy is uh, we're now putting on new product online in a, uh, you know, a really great beach community. 
And we're able to build these units for a fraction of the cost we can sell them on a per unit basis. So you said a 13, uh, I may have missed some details there. I was trying to take some notes, but you said 13 unit multifamily built where a two bed, one bath was? That's correct. Wow. I, give us some details about the units. Are, is that all one beds? Is that like how, how big units are those? So the two bedroom, one bath house is going to stay the same. Uh, other than there's, uh, so it's a two bedroom, one bath house that has an extra room above the garage and it's a two car garage. So the two bedroom, one bath house will remain. We actually renovated it. And right now it has an Airbnb permit and is being Airbnb. And then the two car garage is being converted to a one bedroom unit. The, ex the spare extra room above the garage is being turned into a studio. And then we're building 10 units via a three story structure, basically in the backyard. Wow. Okay. And those are going to be studios on the first and second floor and two two bedrooms on the top floor. You said uh, you all plan to sell this once it's all built? So we're going to uh, build it, lease it up, uh, get it on some, uh, hopefully some good assumable perm debt potentially, and then sell it. So your goal is, is not to be ultimate landlord there long term. Um, so, you know, we're going to do some projects where, we, where they are longer holds and some that are shorter holds. So this, uh, you know, this first project over there in Ocean Beach, that, and we did partner with a guy that's done a lot of these projects, but uh, that first one, we really wanted to kind of introduce our investors to it and uh, start getting the track record of these deals being flipped for a couple of reasons, like a lot of our investors aren't interested in the seven, or, you know, maybe even five to 10 year hold periods, but a lot of them are. So we're going to be uh, providing our investors with opportunities for longer term holds where these can cash flow and continue appreciating. Um, and then some of them are going to be, you know, quicker turns where we can recoup that capital and redeploy it really quickly. Uh, Sean, how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? So the number one thing I'd like you to do if you're listening is to follow me on Instagram, because that's basically a landing page where um, you can get all sorts of my free content. And also there's a link in my bio to where you can access my website. You can, you'll get updates on my blog, all that kind of stuff. You can find me at Sean underscore DeMartel. Uh, maybe you guys can put that in the show notes or something, because I'm sure no one's going to spell that right. The first name, though, I'll, I'll spell it out anyways. It's S-H-A-W-N underscore D-I-M-A-R-T-I-L-E. Um, and you can also find me on my website, InvestorSean.com, S-H-A-W-N. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.